talk was the vaguest, this might be the most malplacé of the talks in this uh, symposium. Um, but I'm gonna step away a bit from the phylogenetics and the like and talk more about how associations between sounds and colors in languages can um, or seem to be correlating with lexicalization patterns of color words. You can see how this affects each other. So uh, I'm just gonna make this a bit bigger. Yeah, so when we talk about lexical change or lexical development, meanings of the lexicons are quite unevenly distributed or connected, as you can see here. And uh, they're affected by a range of things. We have sound change, meaning change, loans, but also iconicity, meaning in this case, the association between sound and meaning. And traditionally, iconicity has not really been taken into consideration in these matters. Recently, it has been somewhat in the usually in form of onomatopoeia or baby talk and things like that. But it seems from several studies that uh, iconicity has um, affected or affects a large part of the basic vocabulary throughout languages, but it should be really taken into consideration. Uh, and if you want to study how the lexicon develops, one uh, way to do it is to look at some sort of subsection of it. Uh, and luckily there's a lot of subsections that are nicely delimited, like networks of meaning, such as dikesis, kinship terms, but also color words. And the reason that we chose color words was because they are more or less universal, because all languages tend to have at least two of them. Um, they are important for perception and cognition, because they are one of the most fundamental descriptors available. And they follow cross-linguistic lex lexicalization patterns, which I come back to at the end. And sound color associations are incredibly common. Uh, and there's a lot of literature on sound color associations uh, in the, um, all types of subjects, adults, children, toddlers, and so forth. Uh, and people have found connections between loudness and pitch and vowel formants and frequency of uh, energy frequency with uh, all kinds of colors or specific um, uh, parameters of color, such as saturation and luminance and so forth. But there are some remaining issues, because uh, most, of, most of these are matching studies, and they, these are based on introspection, which introduces a, a range of different issues. And some of the other really problematic things is the use of colors in these studies, because usually when you have a color, you tend to think of a specific focal color. So if we have blue, then it might be a very Western type of blue, a very bright, saturated type. But it has, of course, a specific hue, a specific saturation, and luminance. And in most societies, people view or divide colors in various ways. Hence, this blue might not be blue for everyone. Uh, we also have acoustic confounds in the form of speech sounds, because if you say that ah is connected with the uh, redness or evoke redness somehow, then ah is also usually produced a bit differently in different languages. It has specific sonority, formants, energy frequency, and so forth. So, <clears throat> so to compensate for this, we try to look at individual dimensions of uh, uh, sounds and colors. And for sounds, we basically included loudness, pitch, spectral centroid, and the first two uh, formant frequencies and trills based on previous literature. And uh, we looked at lightness, the A axis of the color spectrum, so green to red, and the B axis, yellow to blue, and saturation levels in the form of green. And the reason for these colors being so dull is that uh, it, when you carve these colors out from per, uh, some sort of comparable color space, this is what comes out. Because if you control for saturation and lightness, you get these really dull colors. So basically, we executed a test uh, on an implicit perceptual level uh, where we tested accuracy and response times uh, connecting these two uh, different um, uh, parameters of each group. Uh, and we used random combinations of sounds and colors associated with a right and left mouse button and had about 20 participants in each uh, experiment setup. So the participants got uh, two colors and two sounds at the same time 
to one of the colors and one of the sound were to the left and the other one to the right. Uh, and then they had to associate these two with this uh, arrow, and then they were presented with one of them. So either one color or one uh, sound, and have to press the uh, correct mouse button. And this order was then jumbled around in different blocks, and then you get a lot of results, which are very nice, because we found a very strong uh, connection between loudness, pitch, and spectral centroid with saturation, on the one hand, but also pitch and spectral centroid with luminance. But crucially, there was no effect for uh, specific vowels or specific colors. So rather, the underlying parameter seems to be very crucial here. So what do we do with this, uh, this then? Well, we start to looking at natural languages, because this is, of course, very experimental, very set up. So we have to see how does this work in natural languages. Previous cross-linguistic findings on this are quite sparse. Uh, but some people have found that black and night are phonetically similar across languages. Red is connected to R sounds and uh, gray is connected to rounded vowels. Um, but there are also some remaining issues here in the form of that cultures and languages divide colors differently. They have different amounts of colors in their systems. Uh, and also they have used speech sounds rather than, the, than these underlying parameters that we know are important to measure this. So it might have skewed the results a bit. And from study one, we know that lumens and saturation seems important, as well as loudness, pitch, and spectral centroid. The problem here is that we don't really know what these can correspond to in speech sounds in all cases. So what we did was, because we talk about luminous being so important, we wanted to see uh, what bright sounds sound like. So we did a small pilot. We basically just got people to rank acoustic recordings of phonemes in terms of brightness and then found that spectrocentroid and vowel, for, uh, vowel formants were important for this. So basically, EAA, that sounds very bright, while as, yeah, ooh and the like sounds very uh, dark. And then we also have to find some sort of proxy for loudness, because loudness is not really used in, um, uh, in languages. You, there's no minimal pair between ta and ta, or something like that. So you have to use something else. And the closest proxy is probably sonority or amplitude, which is used for syllable formation uh, purposes across languages. Uh, and we hence included that as well. So basically, we have lumens and saturation. Uh, and then we wanted to compare that with the uh, sonority, brightness, uh, spectrocentroid, first three vowel formats for vowels, and sonority and spectrocentroid for consonants. We then sampled 10 color concepts, so the uh, six uh, oppositional color concepts uh, uh, defined by Kay and Muffy and uh, other people. Uh, gray, as it's a common combination, a commonly occurring uh, combination of uh, black and white, as well as these semant semantically related concepts, dark light and night and day. And then we gathered all these words from uh, 245 languages and families uh, to get a nice sample from across the globe. And then we wanted to measure, that, measure their, uh, the sounds that were in their words. So this also poses a problem, because then you have a big database with text, and you want to do acoustic analysis, and that doesn't really work. So we had to basically correspond uh, the, um, the uh, transcriptions of the words into a specific recording. So red becomes er, a, the. and then you can do measurements. Um, and we have the same uh, similar problem for the colors. To avoid this focal color problem, we uh, wanted to look at uh, a, a large data set which was offered by the World Color Survey, which included 110 non-industrialized uh, languages in which native speakers uh, chose uh, color chips that was the best uh, representation of the colors in their uh, language. So if you have two colors, you only have probably black and white, and then you would have those, but if you have five, then you put out all the five colors on this uh, on the chip uh, uh, selection here. So when you do this, you see that uh, you get these nice heat maps, basically, with some sort of blue, some sort of green, some sort of yellow, and some sort of red. And this enabled us to use these color coordinates to correlate our results with some sort of uh, cross-linguistic, cross-cultural certainty rather than using uh, focal colors used in, yeah, so let's say English, for example. Uh, and the results, in short, show that for vowels, we found that uh, luminance was associated with sonority, so high sonority, high luminance, so white had high uh, sonority sounds. 
uh, luminance and uh, uh, brightness ratings and luminance and uh, first form and frequency. But for consonants, on the other hand, we found uh, saturation and sonority uh, values that at least seem to be significant in some... Uh, it's a bit weaker than the other ones, but there seems to be a division between how you use vowels and consonants. So now we try to sum this up to um, connect it to how lexicalization processes work in languages. So first we can say that um, bright and sonorous vowels are overrepresented in light colors, uh, in names of light colors, and uh, sonor sonorous consonants appear to be overrepresented in names of saturated uh, colors or color words. Uh, and the first question we have to ask ourselves, why is saturation and luminance so important and why do we find this in all these studies? Well, the, for luminance, uh, luminance pitch mappings have been found in synesthetes, in non-synesthetes, in toddlers, uh, in chimpanzees. So this is, seems to be very well grounded in our evolutionary history, at least uh, to some degree. Um, and for saturation we have a, a similar situation because saturation levels can be pre-linguistically distinguished by infants and there are some evidence from macaques that there are levels uh, that they can make distinctions uh, between high and low saturation based on uh, biological um, uh, or you can detect it in the brain basically. So why do we find different uh, results for vowels and consonants? That's a bit weird but as it happens, Korean color sound symbolism is a very elaborate sound co uh, color sound symbolism system where you basically can create thousands of color words by inflecting uh, the, uh, the color words. And the primary ways of inflecting it is to use, uh, to change the luminance of a color by changing the vowel height, or F1, which was exactly what we found in our data. So basically, as you see here, you change the A to an E, then it becomes uh, darker. Uh, and for saturation, you can um, uh, modify this by changing uh, the consonant or the, in the plosive. So again, you get this combination between saturation uh, consonants and luminance vowels. Um, so we can say basically that Primary color parameters are affected by uh, iconicity, and it also affects lexicalization processes in Korean. So then we turn this again back to uh, how it works across languages. And if we look at lexicalization patterns of uh, color words, we have the famous Berlin and Case study, uh, which stated that um, languages gain basic color terms in a specific order, uh, which was later developed by Kay and Muffy that uh, said that it was some sort of partition rather than a strict hierarchy, but there were still very clear patterns. And this is how it looks like. So basically, the smaller systems have uh, uh, only two color terms, which is usually uh, something similar to white and black, but that's not really the case. Usually you have a distinction between the light and the saturated colors versus the dark and non-saturated colors, or lower saturated colors. And then, if you have three terms, you always split uh, the lightest colors from the most saturated colors. So this seems to be the secondary and most crucial split. Then you have all of these different ways of getting to full partition, but 83% of the languages tend to do this. So there seems to be something very fundamental to this trajectory. But what we, I want you to take away from this is that all the system, except for these marginal ones here, do a clean uh, division between high luminance, high saturation versus low luminance, low saturation. And the secondary split is between high luminance and high saturation. So if we compare these to our results, we can see basically that the primary split, light, dark, we found strongest effect for luminance. Second split, light, warm, saturated. High saturation was we found uh, iconically as well. So basically, the uh, lexicalization patterns of colors uh, are mirrored by the vowel luminance versus consonant saturation mappings. And this is probably because color is one of the most uh, descriptive features available for humans, so you really want to convey these distinctions somehow. It's important for communication. And there, then you use these primary splits as a vehicle to uh, achieve that. And then iconicity has been shown to aid lexical acquisition, is functional, uh, has functional and communicative uh, benefits. Uh, which then leads to some sort of co uh, culture transmission bias, which you then find in all these languages, which I then found by doing this study. Uh, so to conclude, 
The present studies is controlled for previous confounding factors. We clarify that uh, color uh, sound interaction in cross modal correspondences and um, sound symbolism. We found that the effects are not speech sounds, they're not hues, but rather the underlying parameters. Um, the types can be quantitative or qualitative, and we didn't really go into that because of time issues. Um, the acoustic features are perceived loudness, perceived brightness, and energy distribution, and the visual ones are luminance and saturation. And these mappings are deeply rooted in our evolutionary history. So uh, they seem to shape languages uh, diachronically and synchronically via lexicalization and arise from de uh, developmental and evolutionary factors. Thank you very much for listening and thank you to my co-authors.